Good, mor good morning. Can you hear me? Can it? All right, cool. My name is Gwen Harrison, and I'm here to, I'm from the Illinois State Library, and I'm here to introduce Jay Turner, our keynote speaker. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a little bit about him, and then I'm going to add a little bit, and then we're going to get him started, okay? Uh, Jay Turner is the director of uh, continuing education and training for the Georgia Public Library Service. Where he, be, uh, where he administers a comprehensive learning and development program for the state's 63 library systems. He began his public library career at the young age of 15 as a page. Um, and for almost the past two decades, he has progress progressively served Georgia's public libraries in multiple capacities. Um, Jay is actively involved in the, li in the library community on the local and national level. Uh, Jay has received many awards, uh, in particular in 2014, including the Nix Jones Award, um, the 2012 Pat Carteret Star Award, and he also was named in 2008 an ALA Emerging Leader. He lives with his wife Cheryl, another librarian, and I'm digging that. They have four children, and um, they're um, from Lil Lilbourne, Georgia, and I just ask him a very personal question, which I'm known to do. I'm not going to embarrass you, Ann. What is your favorite toothpaste? Colgate whitening. Here's Jay. Thank you. If anyone can recommend a better toothpaste, I'd be uh, more than receptive. Anyhow, I want to start off by saying thank you to Ann and her team for uh, the hospitality. I found out that Ann is actually a Georgia girl at some point, right from Kennesaw, where on the books, everyone's required to carry a gun. <laughs> I am not making this up. But uh, more so than the hospitality, I really do want to credit Ann for putting together like this dynamic learning event. And I was talking to, to some folks out in the audience earlier and saying that, you know, I've been, you go to enough conferences, sometimes when you leave, I, sometimes I walk away like, why am I still a librarian? But with this one, I'm feeling the energy, right? <laughs> And I'm feeling the enthusiasm and the effervescism, and that's going to carry me. It's going to sustain me when I go back to work. And even when the halo wears off, I'm going to carry that energy. So let me tell you a little story, right? About, about a month ago, I have a son. His name is Christian. He's 12 years old. And he invited me to his middle school career day. Now, my son has uh, taken an interest in what I do over the past couple of years. Because, you know, as a teenager, you walk into a library, you think that everybody who works in a library is a librarian, right? You see the people at the desk, you see the folks out in the stacks helping other people, you, help, you see the folks at the computer helping the, the patrons. And so my son was very fascinated to find out that I work behind the scenes in libraries, right? That there's this shadow world that nobody really sees and nobody talks about. And so my son is like, you know, well, what do you do, Dad? And I said, well, I think the easiest way to explain this is I'm like a corporate trainer for libraries. You know, it's my job to put together those learning programs, those development programs that help the staff members best work with their communities. And my son's been fascinated by that. So he says, Dad, you know what? Will you come to my school and tell my friends about it at career day? And I'm like, shoot, yeah, right, because we need more librarians. So I go out, and the first thing I do is I put a slide on the screen, and it has pictures of me at various points in my career. And there's pictures of me, like, you know, rocking out with heavy metal guys, and there's pictures of me, you know, behind a microphone, and doing all these other interesting things. I ask the kids, you know, what does this guy do for a living? And the first response, there's a, a kid in front of the classroom, and he says, football player. Now, I get this all the time. I'm in airports, and literally everybody thinks I'm Larry Fitzgerald from the Arizona Cardinals. <laughs> <laughs> I even hit Larry up on Twitter one time. I was like, dude, I mean, people think that I'm you. I've been actually offered other people's girlfriends because they think that I'm Larry Fitzgerald. <laughs> it happens at library conferences. Uh, <laughs> And then we get some more, some more guests, and the people are like, uh, well, rock star, or rapper, or hair designer, or fashion designer. And this goes on for a couple minutes, and no one can really figure out, well, what the heck does this guy do? And so I say, you know, I'm a librarian. And right now I work in like, the training aspect of libraries. And I begin to recount to the kids like, some of the things that I've done over the years in my career in libraries. And so I talked about one thing that I'm like, really proud of that we did in Georgia last year, and that was roll out what we call the Georgia Library Education Access Network. This is known as GLEAN by its, by its uh, acronym, and what it is, it's a statewide learning management system. And it's also a place where trainers in, in Georgia's libraries, they can contribute their curriculum on the back end so that we can redeploy it across the state. And so I'm really proud of that. So I talked about that a little bit. And then I talked about, 
when I worked for a large suburban library system, how I helped, you know, make training where it was like nobody's baby, you know, because oftentimes the training department is an afterthought. We made training like not somebody's, like nobody's baby, like it wasn't a bastard anymore. We got it aligned to human resources and we made it where learning actually became a, a part of the culture of the library and it was integrated into the way we evaluated our employees and also it was integrated with the strategic direction of the library. So we talked about that. And then I talked about some of the things that I've done with teenagers when I was you know, earlier in my career and you know about the rock concert we threw in the library and the countywide teen summit that we threw where we brought kids together and parents and mentors to talk about like big issues cyberbullying and sex and drugs and gangs and we were and this was attended by you know hundreds of teens right and I talk about these things and there's a girl who's sitting in the back of the classroom and she says she raises her hand and I call on her and she says it sounds like you have, must have a lot of people working with you and you know I kind of stepped back from that and I thought no no not really I when these things happen I didn't have a lot of people I didn't have a lot of resources I want you all to do me a favor play along with me okay I want everybody to squint your eyes, so squint just a little bit, I want to see it, okay, and squint, and I can see it. Now I want you to tilt your head to the right, and I want you to do this number right here, do your two fingers. Squint your head, turn your head sideways, and do your fingers like this, that might be the number of supervisory years of experience I have in my career, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I've managed to do things that have affected the branches that I've worked in, that have affected the library systems that I've worked with, that have affected my communities, and even in some ways starting to make an impact in the world of library continuing education. And so that's what I want to talk to you all about today. It's this notion that you don't have to be an authority. You don't have to be a manager. You don't have to be a library director. You don't have to have a million dollar budget in order to make things happen, right? So today I want to talk to you all about my experiences in the idea of getting things done, and that is influencing when you don't have the power or authority to do so. In 2005, I finally graduated from undergrad, and I'm gonna tell you this story a little bit later, but I finally got an undergrad in 2005. And to celebrate, I went to a local bar with a mentor of mine, and some of you in this room might know him, his name is Alan Harkness. Alan was an alumnus of this program, I think the first cohort here. And Alan and I were at a bar, Alan doesn't drink but Alan loves him some Diet Coke. And so he might be 12 Diet Cokes in, and I'm drinking my strong Russian Imperial Stout. And as I'm apt to do when I've been drinking, I start asking life's deep questions. I see nods here because I mean, I know that many of you all ruminate and sometimes rather darkly when you've been drinking. And so, and so I, uh, I look over at Alan and I say, you know, Alan, I've been thinking a lot about dying, but I'm not suicidal, don't worry about it, but I've been thinking a lot about what happens when the lights go off, right? What happens when I'm no longer here, but more importantly, what happens to the world that I leave behind? Did, did anything that I do make a difference? And Alan says, you know, I'm not going to really get into like the, the religiosity of this and spirituality of it all, but here's what I think. Alan said that I try to do little things on a day-to-day -day basis to move the needle. I want to move the needle just a little bit so that I leave the world a better place in all the spheres that I run in. And that resonates with me. And so when I think about this idea of influence and getting things done, it ain't about saving the world, right? I mean, because, Anne, you can't do it. You do great things, but you can't save the world. Gwen can't do it. None of us out here can single-handedly save the world. But what we can do, what we can do is we can move the needle just a little bit to make the spheres that we run in better places. So today, I don't have fancy theories to share with you. I can't give you that 40,000 feet above the ground, uh, that, that talk. I, I don't have that. There are people in this room who are far smarter than I am that can tell you about the things to think about when it comes to the future of libraries. But what I can share with you, I can just give you a window. I can give you a window to my experiences, my stories, because at the end of the day, that's all I got, right? I'm gonna share with you how I kind of transformed a little bit and how I saw influence play a role in my life. I'm gonna talk to you about how I kind of transformed from a really shy, socially awkward kid, and I was telling Gwen about this, I mean, just really shy, deathly shy into someone that some people, and I don't know what they've been drinking, they think that I might be an influencer when it comes to like learning in libraries. I, I don't know what they're thinking, but whatever. It doesn't matter. They, some people think that I'm influ influential in this, in this realm, so I'm just gonna go with it. <laughs> so I believe that if we're talking about getting things done, it involves a transformation inside of yourself, right? It involves seeing that you are more than a cog in a machine. I know that sometimes we feel so beat down and so helpless by circumstances that we can't see that. But in my career, I found that I discovered some things along the way that made me realize I'm more than a cog. First thing that happened was the sense of entrepreneurship. 
So we're about to go way back, all right? And it's very uh, apropos that we start here because we're talking about transformations. We're going to talk about transformers. How many of you all remember the toys transformers from the 80s? The robots in disguise, Optimus Prime, Megatron, Starscream, all those guys. I was obsessed with transformers as a kid. The robots that they could transform from guns to cars and all that, you know, unhealthy obsession. And I wanted something at that point in my life. And I wanted to play with every Transformer that came out. But that was a problem. The problem was I had three siblings, and I, worked, and I came from a family that lived below the poverty line. This was back in the day where the clothes came from Salvation Army, the shoes came from Goodwill, and the staples in our cabinet came from a cardboard box that was delivered in a truck on the weekends. And when you open that box up, that was some government cheese and some powdered milk, right? So there was not money to buy the toys. But I remember that I worked really hard in school, first grade, and I'll tell you why. Because my grandfather, he would say, boy, and he would talk like this, boy, if you make an A on your report card, boy, I'll give you, an a, I'll give you $5 for every A you make. So, you know, I wasn't working hard in school just because, you know, education was going to get me out the hood. I mean, I was working hard in school because I wanted that grade money, <laughs> right? Because I needed those transformers in my life. I needed that. It wasn't a one, it was a need. I needed that in my life, right? So whenever I get enough money to buy Transformers, my parents, they would take me to the toy store. And so over time, I had managed to assemble a very small collection of Transformers. Now, when I was in first grade, when it was time to go to recess and play on the playground, I didn't have many friends. So I would go and I would play underneath the monkey bars, usually by myself, but there was one other kid there. His name was Tobias. And so one day, I'm walking over to the monkey bars, and I see Tobias playing in the dirt. And as I get closer, I see that he's playing with a bulldozer. And as I get even closer, I see that he's not playing with just any ordinary bulldozer. He's playing with Scoop. It's a Transformer that had come out a few weeks ago, and I wanted that, right? I needed that. I wanted to play with his toy. So I go over and I say, Tobias, can I play with you? He's like, cool. So we play. The recess bell rings. time to go in. And I say, Tobias, look, I really want to play with this tonight. Can I take this home? He was like, man, my mama would kill me if she knew that I brought this toy to school. Then she'd kill me again if she found out I let somebody else borrow it. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I understand. So I go home, and then I realized that I got Transformers too. And so I reached on my shelf, and I put a little Insecticon in my pocket. It was neon green and black. And the next day, I took it to school to the playground. I go over to the monkey bars. Tobias is playing, and I pull my Insecticon out of my pocket, and I was like, Tobias, let's trade. And so we trade. We have a really great time playing in the dirt. And then the recess bell rings, and I say, Tobias, I need this, I need scoop in my life, man. Can I take it home? And, and he's like, you know what? My mama, she probably couldn't tell the difference from one transformer to the next. <laughs> so you know what? I give him the truth. So we swap transformers. And over the next several days, we were like swapping out our toys. And then one afternoon, Antoine, the classroom bully, this he was a little twerp of a kid. He used to say the meanest things about me. I was bigger than he was. He would say the meanest things about me and the horrible things he would do to my mother. Now, mind you, we're in first grade. Something went right with that boy and something went right with his household. But he was coming over with a, with a couple of the guys that he rolled with, and they came over to the monkey bars. And I'm thinking, oh, shit, right? Because I'm thinking, I'm thinking that Antoine and his boys are about to beat the crap out of me and take my toys. I thought we were about to get gate for our toys. But Antoine was real nice. And he says, guys, can I play with you? And I was like, uh, okay. I mean, like, what do you do, right? I mean, you don't, you don't tell the classroom bully no because it might kick your teeth in. So we let Antoine come over, and he's playing with the toys. And then at the end of the recess, what do you think Antoine does? He's like, can I take some of these home? And we're like, man, we can't do that. And almost in unison, Tobias and I, we both say, man, my mom would kill me if she knew I brought these toys to the, to the playground. And then she'd kill me again if I let somebody borrow them. So Antoine was like, look, man, if we bring some toys tomorrow, can we swap? And it was like, cool. And so he and his friends, they brought their toys. And as, over the course of the school year, all the boys in the playgrounds were trading toys with us. And I was keeping inventory of who had the toys <laughs> because I wanted to play with all those damn robots. Everybody had a role. I mean, we had like a couple of guys like, you know, peeking around the monkey bars, making sure that Miss Denton, the teacher, wasn't going to catch us. And I know that she, I, you know, now I know that she knew what was going on, but, you know, no blood, no foul, right? But that taught me something. That, that was a very early life lesson. And that life lesson was there are rules in the world. If I go to Toys R Us, and I take Optimus Prime off the shelf, and I walk out the door, I'm about to get arrested for shoplifting, which I've been arrested for shoplifting a few times when I was a kid. Now, those rules are interfering with my ability to play with all the toys. And so instead of sticking to the rules, what do you do? You circumnavigate the rules. You find out what's the currency of exchange. You find out how can I get them robots that I need in my life. You have to dream big. The other lesson that I learned from this was even assholes can be allies. <laughs> 
This is important, right? Because I know that none of you all have this experience, but there are, am I, am I preaching to the choir here? There are assholes in your organizations, but they might be tapping the power structures that you do not have access to. Everyone is a potential ally. So I learned that very early on. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> and, the guy, and the guys in the booth, you can, you can like, uh, you know, elite that later, okay? Just, it's, it's, okay. So second lesson, second lesson, all about learning to be an influencer. Second lesson happened to me. We fast forward, uh, the year was 2002. And in fact, I can tell you exactly the date in 2002. It was August 1st, 2002. You know what happened then? August 1st, 2002, I had a kid. Well, you say it all right now, but this was scary, right? <laughs> because August 1st, 2002, my life was not in a good place, okay? August 1st, 2002, I was underemployed. I was delivering pizza part-time for Pizza Hut. I was working part-time as a circulation assistant in a library. And I had just started school again, and I was taking classes full-time at Georgia State University. 13-hour days on Tuesdays, 13-hour days on Thursdays. But in that course of time, from 1998 to 2002, I had dropped out of undergrad three times in four years, and I wasn't even halfway finished, right? So I was underemployed, I had a kid, I wasn't married, I was a huge disappointment to a lot of people. You know, my, my dad used to say that you are the dumbest smart kid that I know. And uh, you know, I, no, I mean, but I like it. It's a moniker that I stick with because that, uh, that influences my approach to the way that I do influence. I am the dumbest smart person that you know because I will ask the dumb questions and I would do dumb things if I think that a change needs to happen. But so during this time, you know, I, uh, I, I became a father, and life was now more than just playing with all the toys. It was more than just getting all the robots for myself, because now I had a kid I had to take care of. So back during this time in 2002, I was really busy, right? I remember working the two jobs and being in school full time. I was real tired. And I remember one day I was coming home from work, and I was driving back to my townhouse in the armpit of a town known as Norcross, and I did something. I fell asleep at the wheel. Two, two miles away from my house, I dozed off, and I rear into the guy who was in front of me. Now, you know, I mean, my heart, who, how many of you have been in a car accident, right? I mean, it's scary. I mean, it's scary. The whole thing about life flashing before your eyes, I think it's real. But I get out the car, and I want to swap insurance information with the guy. I want to call the cops, get it all taken care of. And the guy was like, you know what? Don't worry about it. I just want to get out of here. So obviously, he's riding dirty. But so, I mean, so I'm like, universe, thank you. This is not going to go against my driving record. Everything is going to be fine. So here's what happened. I go home. And I go upstairs, and my heart's still pounding really fast because, I mean, I could have died that night. And I look in the crib at my baby, and I had this other serendipitous moment, and it was I spend more time caught in traffic, going to school, and going to work, and delivering these damn pizzas. I spend more time working at, at these things. I spend with my kid, right? I'm in the business of busyness at that point in my life, and I ask myself, what am I doing here? I mean, am I doing anything that makes a difference? Because I could have died that night, right? If I had died that night, would I have done anything that made a difference? And the answer is no. I needed to get out of the business of busyness. And I made a point right then to do that. And then nine months after this, so after I became aware that I had a purpose in my life, something else happened. Let's fast forward nine months, and we'll go to the summer of 2003. Summer of 2003, Thankfully, I've become employed full-time at the library. I have worked really, really hard trying to impress my coworkers and my management team that I could be an asset. So I'm working full-time. And not only am I working full-time and I'm e exhibiting what I think is like potential to like move into like supervision of that circulation department, you know, things are going great. And so one day, one afternoon, I'm shelving books, and my manager, she comes over to me, and she says, Jay, let me talk to you in my office. And I huff up my chest. And I kind of get my swag on, and I start to walk down the hall because this is the moment where she tells me that we're going to interview you for circulation supervisors. That's what I'm thinking in my head. But we go in, she closes the door, and she sits down, and she peers over the top of her glasses. I know that ain't the conversation we're about to have. So we sit down, and she says, Jay, the leadership team met this morning, and the executive director has announced that we're going to restructure the library. And what this means is that for an organization that has been traditionally hierarchical, we're going to get flat. And so we're going to be taking out levels of management and supervision, and unfortunately, that position that I know that you really wanted to move into is not going to be there anymore. But she said, but it doesn't stop there, Jay. I mean, your position right now, circulation assistant, that's going to go away by attrition. And so here it is one moment I'm thinking that I might be moving up into supervision and making more money, and then now I learned that my job, they're not going to fire me now, but my job is going the way of the dodos. 
and I don't have a college degree, right? And so that really hurt. And I go back, I remember going back to the circulation workroom with the ladies that I work with, and we talk, and everyone's had this conversation, and we're all just so mad and so sad and so hurt. We were like, how could they, right? How could they in the ivory tower do that to us? We're the people on the front lines who are keeping this building open. We're the one who checking out those books. We're the one who getting screamed at. We're the people that people throw books at when they're upset. How could those idiots in the ivory tower do that to the people on the front lines? And for the next couple of weeks, there was great weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth in that circulation workroom. And I remember getting to work one day after this had been going on for two weeks. And I'm, un I'm, 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 I'm undoing the book drop. I'm checking the books in. And you know what? It's like, I can't do this anymore. It's like, I don't want to be a part of this anymore. I can't take this shit anymore. So I went and I go and talk to my boss. And I said, listen, boss lady, I mean, this is really hurting me. <laughs> and I said, well, I mean, hey, this is how I talk. You know, people get it. It's like, this, it's like, this is hurting me, man. I'm, I'm hurting on the inside. I can't deal with this anymore, right? And I remember she, she sits me down very compassionately, and she says this, and this sticks with me to this day. She says, Jay, what happened, this change, this is bigger than you. You can't change this change. But what you can do is you can realize that the only thing you can control is your reaction to what's changing. And also, when things change, there might be opportunities to fix what's broken. And there might be opportunities to make things better when things change. And so that stuck with me, too. So it was this series of these three transformations that really showed me that, you know what, I need to be intentional about the way that I function. And maybe, just maybe, that even though I don't have any power or authority, I should be doing great work in my life. Not the good work, but great work to try to make a difference in the world around me. So now what I want to talk to you all about just a little bit is this idea of the things that the great influencers do. I believe there are certain behaviors that people who are really good at influence, I think they exhibit these on a regular basis. And so these are, just, these are just my truths. These are the things that I've distilled from my own career. And these are the things that I admire about others who I think are influencers. And I want to share these with you. So the first thing is this idea that in order to be a good influencer, I believe that you need to have fans. Now, I want to be very careful about what I mean when I say you need to have fans. Oh, there's a story behind that. Um, <laughs> We were having we were we were having a masquerade party as a as a capstone event for getting all the teens in the library to read the masquerade series, and so we had uh, so we ended up getting all the kids to read this one book, uh, the masquerade, and then we had a party in the library. We had over 125 kids come out for the party, so uh, that was neat. So that's that's me dressed up as what I call a disco king, and then I'll leave it at that. Okay, so you need to have fans. You need to have fans now. This idea of needing to have fans, this does not mean that you have to be a rock star. You don't need to be a rock star librarian. You don't have to be an extrovert. Remember, I mean, that was a point in my life when I was going through school, if I raised my, you know, if the teacher called on me, I would cry. That was a point in my life when I was an undergrad and I would have panic attacks and I have to leave school for the day because it was just overwhelming. And I will share with you this dirty secret, which I told Gwen over dinner the other night. In the year 2000, there was one point where I spent six months in my apartment and I never stepped the foot outside because I felt that people could look through me. And so, so you don't have to be an extrovert, you don't have to be a rock star to, be, to get fans. Getting fans is all about your work speaking for you. I mean, sure, there are gonna be things that people like about you and they might be gravitated toward because you're authentic all the time, but the fandom comes from your work. So what do we have to do to get fans? The first thing is, I believe that you gotta have street cred. I mean, it's your credibility is gonna get you a seat at the table and your street cred is literally the competence in what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. That is the good work of libraries. The good work are the things that keep the doors open. So if you are that circulation person, give that best customer service experience that you possibly can. Be excellent at it. If you are a director and you're having to give a report to your board, I mean, don't just crap together some figures and some numbers and some tidbits and random stuff because you want to put the board to sleep and they won't really care because they don't. And what you want to do is you want to take the time and the effort to put together a meaningful report so that your decision makers know what's going on in the library. Be exceptional about the good things that you do. Second thing about getting fans, I strongly believe that you should do the shiz that nobody else wants to do. How many of you all have been asked to do something in a library that's not sexy? <laughs> How many of you all have been asked to do something that's not glamorous? Yes. How many of you all have been asked to do something that you personally don't agree with? Right. Be willing to do the things that no one else would do. I'm going to tell you a story. So when I finally became a library associate, 
the year 2005, after spending seven years off and on an undergrad, I finally became a professional, a paraprofessional in libraries. And as a library associate at this point in my life, 2005, I'm working in two branch locations. I'm working in the Lawrenceville branch doing customer service, and I had recently started working as a trainer on the back end because some people thought that I might have been good with other people and that they thought I might be good with ILS, and they wanted me to train other folks how to do it. So I'm working in these two positions. And then I get an email from my managers that, that they want me to meet with the executive director. And so, come on, if the director wants to see you and your managers are both CC'd on the email, this is usually not good. So I've got a guilty conscience, and I'm thinking, what have I done? I mean, I can't afford to lose my job now. So we go to the director's office, and we sit down, and she says, says Jay, I, I, I want to talk to you about something, and this is not comfortable. But and I just want you to know that if it's making you uncomfortable, you can just back out at any moment. And so the director tells me that we have a library in the southeastern part of the county that's undergoing some rapid demographic changes, right? This is a place of kind of like post-Katrina, we're getting, you know, it's becoming more of an urban place. And there were accusations among some of the customers that the library staff were being racist. And, and, and the director says, Jay, you know, I mean, you got away with people. But I got to be honest with you. I mean, you're also young, you're also black, and you look like the people in this community. And I want to ask you, would you consider spending a couple nights out of your week going to this branch and being, and being like a stabilizing force? Now, the thing is, you know, I don't like doing anything in my life just because of things I can't control, right? I can't control my age. I can't control my gender. I can't control my race. I really don't like to be given things because of that, and I don't like to be asked to do things because of that. But you know what? This was for the good of the community. And you know what I said? I said, I'll do it. And so all I'm saying to you is sometimes it's bigger than you, and you have to be willing to do the things that no one else wants to do because that gets you seen as a team player. And sometimes you can capitalize on that political capital you're building by being seen as a team player. Third thing, building fans, hyper-focus on passion. I believe that there's like a really powerful force that gets unleashed when you're able to find a way to unleash your passion and your work. And so, yeah, I mean, I've done jobs I'm not necessarily passionate about, but there are some things in my life that I can bring to the table that can make my work not feel like work. So, for example, when I was a library associate, my library system didn't have teen librarians, but they were asking that each branch designate one or two people who would do programming for teens. Now, I took that job because I wasn't far removed from being a teenager, and I was a troubled teen. And so it was like, let me see if I can do some good here. When I moved up into the training world, you know, I'm a gamer. Right now, at this point in my life, I've got over 1,000 video games. I mean, maybe like 300 I've never touched. But, I mean, I was looking at ways to how can I incorporate gaming into training, right? How can I make learning fun? And then when I moved up into, like, you know, managing training and then getting to the state level, I'm all about technology. And what can we do to unleash technology to make learning more efficient and more effective, right? Are there ways we can do that? And so I look for the ways to bring that passion into what I do. And here's why. Because people follow people who are passionate. You want to align yourselves with the people who really love what they're doing. That energy is contagious. So hyper-focus on your passions. That'll help you get some fans. Then the last two things we're going to group together, and this is sharing what you're doing, thinking out loud. If no one knows what you're working on, they can't be fans. Sometimes you don't have to wait until something's done. Sometimes people want to see the sausage being made. And there's nothing wrong with sharing the sausage as you're making it. There's nothing wrong with flying the airplane while you're building it. You know, and there's so many rich opportunities to do that, especially now in the age of social media. You don't have to wait until a project's done. You can talk about, you know, the challenges that you're facing. The beauty of this is, as our, uh, David Lankett said the other day, is the more voices you get in on this, I mean, sometimes they can help inform the problems that you're trying to tackle. And likewise with dreaming out loud. You know, I am a person who dreams out loud. And I think Mara can attest to this in, uh, in our realm of CE. I literally look at, I don't look at always what we have to be right now. I always look at what if. What if we were more than what we are right now? And really, I try to beg people to ask those questions and to dream along with me. And I think that sometimes we have a fear of doing this because we have a fear of getting our ideas ripped off. And I've been ripped off multiple times. I mean, especially it feels like the higher that I go, the more that my ideas get ripped off. And it used to bother the heck out of me but it doesn't bother me anymore. You know why? Because if someone rips it off and they make something happen, they solve the problem and that's all I care about. I mean, we're, this is libraries, right? I mean, you're not gonna get rich doing this and nobody really cares what you're doing out in the broader sphere of things. You're not gonna be famous, so why have the ego? Second thing I believe is that people who are influential, people who influence well, they are very conscious of how they work through others. 
there's, I mean, I believe there's almost like a sixth sense that you have to hone in order to be uh, particularly uh, influential. And that's been able to spot in any situation, you know, who are the stakeholders, how they feel about you, how they feel about each other, what's the, what's the money in the equation, and that's always the currency of exchange so that you can get people to actually do something. I actually had to learn about this in this systematic way of thinking kind of early in my career, and I want to go back and talk about a job that I was given uh, shortly after the library reconfigured. So remember, we talked about, oh, uh, you get the joke right, there we go. <laughs> to the window, come on, y'all, don't leave me up here. <laughs> to the wall, okay, right? So that, there's a story here. Okay, so in 2003, when the library uh, underwent its restructuring, that was a physical change that was gonna happen to all the library branches. You know, we historically had two departments, like most libraries did, circulation and reference. But we were going to be combining to a one help desk model, one service point. Again, we we're trying to be more nimble and, and to the customers to come to the library. So we're gonna have the one help desk. Now, I know that doesn't sound, that doesn't sound innovative now, but back in 2003, there weren't a lot of libraries doing this. But in order to combine those two departments, a physical transformation had to happen inside of the building. And my manager approaches me and she says, Jay, I want to give you an opportunity to lead this project. Now mind you, at this point in my life, I'm 23 years old, I'm still just a circulation assistant, I don't have a college degree, I'm the youngest guy on, on the team, I don't look like the people I work with, these ladies are old enough to be my mom, and in some cases old enough to be my grandma. I mean, it was, I, I was a misfit and I was young and really green. But she says, I want to give you a chance to lead this. And she says, because I think that you can do this and this will be instructional for you. And so I said, okay, I'm gonna do it. So we had 30 days to reconfigure the interior of this library. And I knew that we were gonna have challenges, right? Because we had the circulation department, the, the women in that department. We had the women in the reference department. And I know that they have never really worked together and they're cliquish inside of those departments. And then to add a complication to this equation, the heavy lifting was gonna be done by county inmates. And so, <laughs> Yes, and so, and all the women, even though they had their differences, the one thing they could agree on was that they were totally <laughs> creeped out by the idea that they were going to have prisoners helping to reconstruct this library. But I took the task, and I remember, you know, that first week went by, and just feeling somewhat, um, you know, vexed that things weren't moving very fast. And it wasn't the plan about how to do things, right? I mean, I came up with a brilliant plan about how to get all the books off the shelf, off the shelves, and how to get all the shelves rearranged, because I've moved a lot of my life. And my process, it ain't pretty, but it works. I mean, I can always directly translate one physical location to a new one based on like this really simple process that I have. So it wasn't the process, it was the people. And so I go to my manager and I say, you know, boss lady, I'm having some problems. I can't get people to really move fast enough and we're already one weekend and we go this pace, it's not gonna happen. So she says, well, Jay, do you want me to give you some advice? You want me to tell you what to do? And I said, well, you know, really, I, let me just think out loud because I think out loud. And so, I mean, as we're talking, I start to have some ideas. And I was like, you know what, let's, let's do this. What if we got the, the ladies from different departments to pair up in pairs or trios and get them to work together side by side? You know, why not? Because we have to cross-train each other anyhow when this uh, reconfiguration is done. So why don't we get each other, why don't we get folks comfortable being next to each other? And then, you know what, why don't I talk to the inmates, right? Because I'm sure that these guys have more life skills than being criminals. I mean, maybe. <laughs> Maybe someone might have been like an architect or a contractor. Maybe they can help me with my process to make this move better. And then, you know, it's like, you know what, and boss lady, would you have a problem if we just like brought out some radios and, you know, the coffee maker? You know what, because I'm thinking that everyone is still so demoralized and feeling so bad about this change that we're all going through as a library system. I mean, what if we just had fun, right? I mean, what if we just did this project, everybody's working on something together, but we make it irreverent, we make it fun, if we get tired, we give each other massages, we drink coffee, I mean, it's all good, can we do that? The boss lady says, yep, we can do that. And it all worked out. And the reason why it worked out is because, again, you're using that sixth sense of reading people and knowing who the stakeholders are, how they feel, and what was the currency. And the currency was, let's have fun while we make this happen. To the window, to the wall, the story here is that the county inmates really love their hip hop, and this was the song that was on the radio all the time that summer. <laughs> And so, and so, and you know, the inmate guys, they're, they're, they're doing the whole thing, right? I mean, they're doing the whole verse. And then like, you know, and the ladies, they were like, what's skeet skeet? And I was like, you know what? <laughs> I, can, I can't even go there. I can't even go there. <laughs> <laughs> the third thing that people who are influential do, I believe they do this one thing very well. Now, I can't give a master class on this. Phil, yesterday, he got really in the detail. The guys from Harvard, he worked for McKinsey Consulting. He could do a lot better job about this than I can. But what I've determined is that it's not good enough to be able to tell a story. You have to be able to sell a story. 
Now, you don't have to be a master storyteller to do this, but there are four things I believe that you have to do when you're trying to sell a story to make something happen, when you're trying to get somebody to buy into a vision, to do something different. The first thing you have to do is you got to convince people that it's time to make moves. And, that, you know, that, that's my turn. We've got to make some moves. And we've got to do it now because the status quo isn't working. So you have to be able to highlight, you know, why is what we're doing not working and why is that we need to move? And not only do we need to move, but why do we need to move now? I like to create this sense of urgency around anything I'm trying to do when it's time to do a vision. Because you can put it out there, but if you're not, a, if you're not encouraging people to act and act now, then you're going to be waiting forever. And I don't like to wait. I grew my hair out. I, I believe that, um, oh gosh, I can't remember her name, uh, but she did a session. Thank you. Yes, she was mentioning my hair, and she gave me a compliment and talked about like, how, how nice my hair looked. And, you know, I like compliments. You know, this is currency in my book. You know, so if you want to get currency with Jay, compliment me. <laughs> Flattery gets you everywhere, my dear. But uh, so she made a compliment about, about my hair, and I said, well, you know, I started growing this as a symbol of patience. When I found that I was going to be a father for the first time, I decided to lock my hair. And so here we are, 12 years later, almost 13 years later. I mean, I haven't cut my hair because I'm not patient yet. But, again, it's all about getting people to move. When you're selling that story, is always you have to be able to point out the here versus the there, right? I mean, right here, we're in this situation, but I want to get you to there. Not, not, not just there, I want to get you there, right? The wistful there. And you have to be able to show people what's the, what are going to be those key actions we have to do along the way to get there. You don't want to give them all the details, but, I mean, you can make the, tan, you can make the plan tangible and to create this sense of movement behind it. The third thing that people do who do compelling stories they are able to unleash their, their fans. This is really powerful because it makes the stakeholders and the decision makers more likely to do something when the idea is coming from someone more than just you. One of the things that I've been very fortunate to be a part of is being a member of the, the, uh, com the Continuing Education Community of Practice, right, the CE Forum. We are a group of practitioners, and we get together once a year in uh, different states, and we talk, we talk shop. We share ideas and best practices about learning. And one thing that I found in my experience with these CE people was that there have been like whispers that were bubbling up to the surface over the years that we wanted to find better ways to share our ideas and share our resources and make better partnerships. And so, you know, the idea didn't start with me, but I do like to think that I was kind of instrumental in getting that conversation galvanized. And what happens is, when it was more than just me saying that we need to be trying to build a platform to encourage this, it really took off. I mean, the idea finally got in front of the people who made the decisions. It got in front of IMLS. It became a priority. One of the funding priorities for IMLS's last year was a national digital platform. And I believe that that wouldn't have necessarily made it to the table if we hadn't gotten the voices from the community to say, we need this. And so unleash your fans. And then finally, I like to be able to say that you, you got to convince people that success is right around the corner. You know, even if success is really five years away, you got to be able to sell the idea that, you know what, we're on a burning platform, and if we jump into the ocean, we're going to be better to be on this, on this burning platform. So that's a success <laughs> in and of itself. Even if, even if we don't quite swim, we're not going to burn to death on the platform. So it's, it's building this idea in that we can be successful if the, uh, if the uh, initiative actually goes through, but we can still be successful just for trying. That's what you have to be able to do when you tell a story. The other thing that I want to talk about is one of my best, I, one of my best pitches for selling a story. And I, and I don't know how much time we have. I didn't turn my timer on. I got to keep it moving. So, selling the story. Back in the year 2005, when I was really working with teams, uh, my library system made that the year of the team. They said that as a, as a library, as Gwinnett County Public Library, we're going to focus on teens this year. We're going to make this a strategic priority for us. Now, you know, it's one thing to say that, and then it's another thing to actually devote resources to it and to see it through. Here's what started happening. We're doing Year of the Teen stuff. Every branch has now designated two teen representatives for each branch, and each branch will have a teen advisory board. Does any of this stuff sound familiar? Where you bring the teens in, they're supposed to inform library services and programs. Well, a couple things. First of all, the programs that we were throwing as teen representatives, they were dismally attended. Nobody cared, but I mean, you already knew that, right? I mean, if you've ever worked with teens, you know, the, the attendance might be dismal. And then those teen advisory boards, I mean, who wants to serve on a teen advisory board? I mean, if you're a teenager, I mean, I've got other things to think about, like video games and girls rather than coming to a library and trying to advise you on how to provide services to me. So we were having just dismal attendance all around. 
And I remember sitting down with my teen advisory board one afternoon, and we we're having the same conversation of like, what can a library do to attract more teens? And so some of the kids were like, let's do more open mic nights, and let's do gaming nights, and let's you know, teach people how to make video games on Sploder. And then one girl's like, let's do American Idol because, you know, like American Idol is really growing in popularity at this point in time. Then one of the other kids was like, you know what, let's have a concert. And I was like, yeah, I like this. And I like this because my personal life at that point in time, I was managing some rock bands. You know, I thought that I was going to get out of undergrad, my degree is in public relations, and I thought I was going to get out of undergrad and move to L.A. and, you know, just kind of be a lark for bands and just kind of live the life on the, on the coattails of, like, all the great musicians. And so I had some bands in the, in the Atlanta rock and roll and heavy metal scene, and I was like, you know what, I bet these guys would do a show at the library just because it would give them another place to play in front of the kids who might buy their music. So I take this idea to my manager, and I say, hey, what do you think about us having a rock concert in the library? And my manager's like... Yeah, let me let me investigate for that before you now get back to you. <laughs> a couple weeks pass by and I haven't heard anything. So I go to boss and I say, boss lady, what's the status of this rock concert? I mean, can we do it? It's just like, I don't think it's going to happen. And so I, I let it go, right? But then a couple weeks later, we had a meeting of like all the teen representatives from all the branches. We met at the headquarters building with the events and outreach manager. And we go through this meeting. It's like two hours and like all the team representatives are talking about just like how dismal their teen advisory board attendance is and how dismal their programming numbers are. And they all leave the meeting, they're frustrated. And you know what? I kind of stayed in my chair after everybody left and the events and outreach manager was there by herself. Now, she and I, we have like just a little bit of history. We used to work together back in Mountain Park. And I knew that she had a kid who was 17 years old who played music. And so I said, hey, listen, wouldn't it be cool if we had this rock concert in the library and your kid could play in the show? It would be kind of cool, right? And so she was like, you know, let me think about that. You know, so I was like, yeah, let's do a concert and your kid can play. Let's, let's let me think about it. So then I get called to the director's office a week later. I, I'm always going to call to the, to the director's <laughs> office. And she says, well, Jay, tell me about this concert. And so I knew then that like my first two pitches, they got people interested, but they weren't really hitting the point. So, I mean, I just took a deep breath and I started bloviating whatever came up, but I think it worked. And I said, what if? What if the library was more than a place where kids came because their parents needed two hours of extra work and the kids didn't need to be unsupervised? What if the library was a place that teens actually wanted to be? What if people thought that the library was cool? What if, they, if teens thought the library was cool? What if this was a preferred destination? Here's the thing. I know that we made 2005 the year of the teen, but what I can tell you is that the year of the teen right now is a colossal failure. I don't have a plan for how to make our teen programming better. I don't. But what I do know is that we got to do something, and this whole idea of 12 different branches doing 12 individual things is not working. So all I propose is simply this. Let's pool our resources, let's throw a concert, and let's just see what happens. And guess what? The director takes it to the board of this very conservative county, and we throw a rock concert. We have 350 kids come out. We get sponsorships by Coke and Sonic and Chick-fil-A. The bands that I invited to this thing, they got some free recording time from the local band studio. So everybody won. Now, system-wide, did this make a long-term impact? I like to think that maybe it did, because a few years later, we organized a countywide teen summit with the whole idea that we should be pooling our resources, doing bigger things instead of small things. And also, when I was still in that position, my teen advisory board attendance was up, and teens appeared to be interested in what we did, and this team of team representatives, we won uh, Team of the Year for 2005. So I like to think that being able to pitch that story was instrumental in getting some of those impacts. The last thing that I want to talk about is this. I believe that influencers are always looking to take the moon shot, right? I feel this is so Pollyanna, but I feel that if you really shoot for the moon, and if you do so strategically, even if you miss, you're going to fall in the stars. So I mean, you should always be shooting big, right? <laughs> You should always be shooting big. And it's nothing wrong with driving the Pinto. The Pinto, it cranks, it runs, it gets you from point A to point B. But it ain't gonna get you that sexy. It ain't gonna get you that in style. It's not, it's, not gonna, it's not gonna move you forward. But that Cadillac, you're gonna be sexy, you're gonna be stylish, and you're gonna be really moving forward really fast. And so I think that the people who are influential, they are able to get people to take, take a shot for the Cadillac. And so what I wanna talk to you about this last thing now is just where I am right now in my career. Because we've kinda gone the whole arc. And the last place where we are right now is really trying to make the Cadillac of learning systems for libraries. I proposed that state libraries 
need one place where all the learning objects, the things that we develop, our course curriculum, our e-learning source files, all the video tutorials we make, I feel that we need to have one place for those things to live. And the beauty of having one place for those source objects to live is that we can, under, you know, you put them in a learning object repository and you use Creative Commons and then the people in the individual state libraries, they can remix and reuse those source files and make them local to their training needs. That's one part. I also say that beyond just a place to store the source files, we need a place where people can take the e-learning. But beyond just take those classes, they can actually have it managed. You can keep track of your test scores. You can keep track of your learning transcripts. Wouldn't it be great if we were all in the same infrastructure and if you left one library in Colorado and you moved to Illinois or Iowa, that your learning history came with you? That all you have to do is move from one group to another? I mean, wouldn't that be neat? And also, wouldn't it be cool if we had one platform where state library CE coordinators could go and they could co-develop blended learning classes together. They could do their own MOOCs together, all from one platform in the cloud. And the thing is, it doesn't have to cost your state library a lot of money because somebody else can care for you for that baby. That's the big vision. That's the Cadillac. That's what <coughs> I've been trying to do for the last couple of years was to get everyone toward this. Is it gonna work? I don't know. Will it get funded with the LB21 grant that we put in? I don't know, but guess what? The only thing that matters is now people are listening and people realize that we have this issue and that we're trying to solve it. You shoot for the Cadillac. In the first year that I proposed this, I couldn't get the Cadillac. But what I was able to do was I was able to get my state library to say, Jay, your idea, it might be a little bit too nebulous and esoteric for us right now, but we're gonna give you resources to try to do something in your own backyard. Now, I didn't make this, this is a licensed product, but the theory is still there. The theory is all the same. And what I've hoped to be able to do and what I've tried to do with my community is to evangelize the idea. It's like, you know, here's a product that does all these things that I've tried to say that we need to do. Now, I'm not saying that we need to buy this, but now you can see it in action. And now, that, now you know that I have a year of experience under my belt, I can show you that it works. And the other thing about like the Cadillac and the Pinto, Let's go back to that whole idea of learn. There was one point where I was really unconvinced that I would be able to get my state library to help me and support my endeavors. So I'm gonna tell you what I did. What I did was I called Discover, my credit card company, and I took out a $25,000 loan. And I said, if I can't get the right people behind me to help make this and we need it, I'm gonna do it myself. And I put up a Kickstarter because I believe in this idea so much that other people will help me if they believe in it too. But the great part about it is I never had to use that money and I sent it back to the bank. But the bottom line is the people who influence, they, shoot, they take that moonshot. They take those risks. And that's what I'm asking you all to do. When you go back from this experience, when you go back home from I Lead You, and when the energy wears off, when the inspiration from this wears off, I want you to keep this one thing in your mind. I want you to, be, I want you to ask not what is, but what if. What if we did something different what if I, from where I am in my position, whether I'm a director or a manager or a library school student, what if I did the small things to move the needle? How can I make the world a better place? Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. And I think we have a few minutes. Do we have any questions? Going once, going twice. <laughs> In the back, please. Yes. So on your nationwide library learning system, are you including schools and teachers in that? Is that something you're seeing as the next step, or do you see their needs as being too different from librarians? So I'm just going to repeat for the uh, people virtually. So the question is, for the learn platform that I alluded to, uh, does this have some potential for uh, libraries outside of state libraries, like schools? And the answer is, I, I think that what makes the most sense is to start small, to start in a group that is very homogenous so that we can see how we can best work together. But I do believe that there's possibility that, you know, once it gets made, because I believe that it will get made eventually, once it gets made, that we can open this up. And this could be not only something for public libraries and state libraries, but for school libraries and academic libraries. I mean, in, a great, in, in, the, in the grand scheme of things, I would like to see any library across the world to be able to use this platform. Others? And 
you're so optimistic and refreshingly positive. I just, I love your outlook. What do you do with the, the naysayers, the it's never going to work, Jay? How do you internalize that and keep the, the optimism going? Well, you know, I mean, I think, I think it's all a matter of perspective. And, and the bottom line is there have been so many times in my life when I've been told no that it just rolls like water off a duck's back. You know, at the end of the day, what's going to happen is I'm going to die, right? I mean, and I, I, I hate to be morbid about it, but I'm going to die. And whatever you have to say about my ideas, whatever you have to say about me as a person, it doesn't matter because it's not going to keep me alive any longer. And so, I mean, so, it, that, so the, the naysayers, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt me. But oftentimes I listen to the naysayers. And I, and I really had to listen to the naysayers when it came to this learn platform because there, was, there were a lot of things that the naysayers said that I think perhaps made my proposal stronger. So you always have to listen to, like, you have to listen out for, like, golden nuggets of wisdom, even when people are saying things that you not necessarily want to hear. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. How'd you learn to let go of fear? Oh, well, I can actually tell you about this. Um, you know, I am still constantly gripped by fear, like all the time. And I try not to let it show on the outside because if I let that show, then other people are going to become afraid around me. But what I've done in my own personal life to get past fear is I look for situations where I can increasingly do things that are less safe. And then you have to take baby steps. So, for instance, when I was coming off of like being an agoraphobe and I started working in the library again, because you'll notice there's a gap in my resume where I stopped working for a couple years, and it's because I was too afraid to be around people. But what I did was I realized that I got to be around people to make money, right? And so I can't hide out inside a circulation workroom. I can't just shell books. So I'm going to, like today, I'm going to make it a point to go out on the help desk. And I'm going to talk to somebody. And then the next day, I'm going to talk to somebody else. And increasingly, I'm going to try to become even friendlier to the people that I talk to. <laughs> until ultimately I don't have that fear of interacting with someone on the help desk. And so you just keep doing that and you keep radiating outward and taking those baby steps to put yourself in increasingly uncomfortable situations and you'd be surprised at how much you can reprogram yourself. The happiest moment in my life was when I learned to let go of fear. It was, it was mm -hmm. it's like before and after. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, fear holds us back. Yeah. yeah, fear keeps you from pursuing the what if, right? Yes? You were mentioning the need to do things even if you didn't feel that they were part of your job or And what is your feeling about um, those situations where you're asked to do something and then now it becomes part of what you're doing and it maybe distracts from some of the goals or achievements you see yourself in your position? You know, I definitely think that as professionals, we all have a responsibility to, uh, to have honest and courageous conversations. And I think that oftentimes we find ourselves in a situation where we've taken on more responsibility, but we are too afraid to go to our leadership and say, this ain't part of the bargain. Now, I think there, there's, I think there's certain ways that you have to do that, and you have to be very diplomatic, and also you have to pick your battles and choose which hills you're going to die on and which ones you won't. But I do believe that we all have to make room in our lives to be honest and to be courageous and have those conversations and to say, look, I realize that you need this from me, but there are other things that you've asked me to do. And for everything that I'm saying yes to, I'm saying no to something else. The, the Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, oh, we have one more? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I just am wondering, how do you convince your colleagues to take risks with you? Yeah, so, you know, that, that's actually a really good question. So one thing that I found, because I'm, I've, you know, after I've gotten out of working in branches and really moved into, like, learning in, in libraries, I found that I've been a, a shop of one, right? And so the way that I get my colleagues to take risks with me is I always try to find ways that my work crosses over with theirs. And so I try to look for those natural partnerships where, you know, I, if I need resources from what you have, I try to say, you know, how can we work together? And also, just knowing that since we're going to be working together, I mean, how about we consider doing something like this a little bit differently? And just really engaging them on the ground floor about, and being honest, I need your resources. I can help you. Here's the value I can bring to this equation. But I, I want to ask us to do something just a little bit differently this time. All right. Well, hey, thank you all.